appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right, hope you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thanks, Ruben. So did you are you in the building somewhere? <laughs> no, I'm in the parking lot. <laughs> that is so the modern way of doing classes. Um, Oh, you guys, sorry, I'm just pacing. Uh, but yeah, here you can see the lab. I'm on my iPad in the lab and I just met Ruben in person a second ago. So this is pretty cool. Um, I'm gonna uh, let a few more people join. I There are several more people who picked up scopes today and were driving back. And then I'm gonna do tonight, the plan is to do a demo on uh, coloring and on my god the lab is so messy right now <laughs> this is like backstage at a concert or something there's just chaos um anyway i'm going to do coloring and um also i'm going to show you how to make slides so actually i'll just start is it recording it is yeah we'll just get started with um the intros feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have questions or anything like that um 
I'm gonna actually take off my mask. So I think you can hear me better that way. Um, so you're staring at a picture of a Zy, uh, my iPad down. Um, and I guess I'll flip it to me while I'm talking. Let me see, switch cameras. Um, yeah, not flattering, let's see. We can do it. I'm sorry. I'm just. We've been attempting. Um, the computers are really weird. They won't let me. I was going to try to zoom from the computer, but they won't let me. Um. So, what I am. I'm looking for a place to put it down. Sorry if it's taking a while. Okay. Well, that's kind of a start. Okay. So. Um, what I want to demo today is coloring, which is basically aligning your uh, scope, aligning the light path in your scope. And it really boils down to, it sounds really fancy, but it really boils down to making sure the condenser is in the right place. And um, <laughs> it's a really important thing to do. I'm laughing because uh, now my battery is low, so I'll, I'll take a break to plug it in. But the reason I'm telling you about coloring today is because some of you just got your scopes. And um, the way we've taught you on these Meiji scopes is you do the first lab, which is exploring how to image on a scope. Hey, Ashley and Jessica. Um, and Layla, good, people are signing in, awesome. We just started. And I was just saying, I'm gonna teach you how to color today. It's actually going to be the lecture subject for next week, but I wanted to give you the practical demo today because um, those of you, hey, precious, you made it. Um, hi. Those of you who got your scopes, hi. Um, today, although your first lab, which is, it's all up um, online canvas, you have lots of stuff there. Um, we normally start you off with how to use a scope and just the basics of it and that's your first lab but the problem we we found out last time is that when the scopes travel sometimes the condenser gets knocked out of alignment and so you may need to actually do look at lab two in your lab set on the mages and um, do that first even before you start with lab one because um, if well, I'm going to show you, but basically if when you try to put a slide on and you can't see anything, it's just terrible. Probably you need to fix your condenser. And this is one of the most valuable things we teach you in this class because um, it's surprising how many scopes out there are just out of alignment and people when they've gone on to do jobs or internships or, you know, I mean, I even did this for my vet once. <laughs> It was like, my scope doesn't work. And I'm like, let me look at it. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of scopes out there sitting there unaligned where people don't know about coloring. And so they, the scope gets out of whack. They can't get a good image. They abandon it basically. So we found that this is a great way to make a first impression in a lab where they're like, that scope doesn't work. It's never worked. It's been five years since it worked. Often all you have to do is color it. It's often that simple. Not always, but often. So you may encounter this problem too when you unpack your scope if it's been bounced around even though you've been super careful. Um, the condenser gets out of alignment pretty easily. And what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna show you how to do it. And then in lecture, um, I have a more in-depth uh, explanation about this theory of it, and I'm probably gonna, that's your next week's lecture, but I'm, I've already made it. I'm probably gonna post it. I just need to record it. I'm probably gonna post it for you on Friday, maybe even tomorrow, so that if you're at home with a scope and you're like, this is not working, <laughs> okay? This is probably the reason. Skip to lab two, look at, you know, rewind, rewatch what I showed you today, um, watch the lecture if it's up about coloring. The lecture is going to be a lot more about the theory. This video is about how you actually do it. And, um, you know, and then so when you get your kits at home, your kits and your um, scopes, 
be sure to go online in Canvas and read. There's a Read Me First document that says like about how to unpack it and what to do and what should be in your kit. So read that. And then notice that Dante, who you met today, um, is our Scope Helpline. And he's available from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. It's amazing. He's the program's lab tech right now. I'm also an advanced student. And he... Um, well, like you can text him because, you know, right, Ashley, like basically if you have any issues and you're in the middle of it, I'm slow. I take at least a day to get back to you. And um, often it's a small thing and you can just text him and he'll help you troubleshoot and figure it out so you can keep going with your scopes. You have them for um, five weeks, including spring break. I'm very excited for you to have them this long at home. Um, I think you're going to do great stuff with them. Lab Wednesday lab, you also get them for five weeks. Um, so from now on, the class splits. Wednesday and Monday labs are doing different things. Wednesday labs, I'm sorry, I'm working on getting your optics um, lab up. It should be up by tomorrow. Okay, um, we're going to take, I'm going to go plug this in. I'm going to get my charger, and then I'm going to show you how to color. Oh, and the second demo I'm going to do today is, um, I'm going to demo how to make your slides, basically. So I'll be right back. Okay, I actually have to get the charger from next door. So apologies for that. I'll be back in a few minutes. Like two minutes, even less. All right, hi everyone, I'm back. And I'm looking for a place to plug this in. Okay, I did what happens in a lot of microscopy labs, which is you climb under the desk. <laughs> and there's, here, let me show you. There's so many cords under there, it's fun. Oh, and it's not charging, there it is. Let's see, switch camera. So, see it's a jungle under here. This is very typical of microscopy labs. There's a lot of crawling under desks and um, switching out things and plugging in and so on. Okay, so I've been trying, I was trying to get the computer itself to log in, but it won't. 
So let me give me this switch. I am going to just point this. Hold on a sec. Sorry about taking so long, but um, the computers here have weird restrictions about what they will and won't do. Like one of them won't let me Google, which is just bizarre. Okay, well, okay, so this is the scope and we're gonna use this scope because I can show you what I'm doing on the um, actual computer. I will point it out on the mages that you have um, where the parts are that you need to deal with. But I thought this was better than pretend, you know, trying to shoot down the ocular to show you. Okay, so this is a Zeiss scope. And the first thing that you would do for Colory is to align the light bulb in your mages and in this, it's fine, it's set. What you're really gonna need to do is figure out what went wrong with the condenser. So I just put a slide on. The first thing you do is put a slide on and then you focus. This is a really bad slide of a fascinating thing. It's a rabbit tongue slide. And you can see, <laughs> now disregard the fact that you're only seeing part of the image here. Let me give you, um, and actually I'm gonna put it, I just colored it, so I'm gonna put it out of whack a little bit to give you a sense of like, what you might encounter. Go back. Go back up. <laughs> it's so out of whack. It won't let me. Okay. Um, so let's say you're like, wow, this slide, aside from whether this is rabbit taste buds, those are the taste buds at the top, and then there's just a lot of muscle. And you might play around and you're like, there's just something wrong with the light, right? You're looking at this going, this is terrible. I don't know what's going on. Well, it's out of Kohler is probably the answer. So coloring just means it's a type of illumination, but it basically means that you have to align the condenser. The condenser in the scope is in this housing. So this whole housing houses the condenser and the light is coming out of here. And um, there's actually um, an aperture that's called a field stop in front of the light here that I can close down and on the scope I'm doing on the side on your mages it's actually right there you just fiddle with it and so I'm closing it down <laughs> okay and this field stop we usually leave pretty much open as you'll see but it's very useful for coloring the other big thing that we're going to use for coloring is um well actually let me just say in next order we're going to move the condenser and any scope that can be colored is going to have a focus knob for the condenser and it's going to have centering screws. But actually, before you get to any of that, I'm going to come back to this slide. I got a little distracted. So the first thing that you're going to do is actually put a slide on your scope. And then let me go back to where it was when I started. So your scope might have the um, focus way down. Hopefully we packed them away that way. So I'm moving the focus on the scope. And as you can see, the stage itself moves. So as you might remember from last time, you only move course focus and only touch the course focus, which is this on this scope, when you're at lowest power. So make sure your scope is on lowest power. It's the red, it's the shortest one, it's 4X. And then what I'm gonna do, <laughs> I'm just going to get rid of it. Well, take down the light for a second. The scope, it's funny when they aren't used for a while, they start having all kinds of issues. <laughs> so I'm going to go all the way up with the course focus to find the focal plane and get my slide in focus as I'm, so I'm going up manually and things are coming into focus, even though it's bad and blurry and the lighting's bad. You can kind of see when what you can see gets into focus. So remember how bad this image is because <laughs> we're going to make it better. So I have found, I went up all the way up 
And then I came a little bit down and got the slide more or less in focus. And of course, on your Magis, you don't have a computer. You're just going to do it by looking through the oculars. Um, and then if you're me, you take the slide off. If you're some other people, you leave it on. It's really up to you. It's correct either way. People fight big fights over it, but in truth, it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> so you've got the most relaxed uh, microscopist here with me. OK, so now we're going to color. Um, what I should see is not a circle of light, but what I want to see is even illumination across the entire field of view. You can see it's rectangular because it's a there's a chip in the camera. And um, so we should get a nice evenly illuminated rectangle of light, not this blurry circle of light. How do we get there? Okay, well, we need to fix the, we need to color it, we need to fix the condenser. So can everybody hear me okay? By the way, give me a thumbs up on the audio quality, just making sure I'm speaking loud enough, et cetera. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so let's see. So coloring, <laughs> it's just weird talking to an iPad. Um, <laughs> let me gather my thoughts for a minute. Okay. So the first thing you're gonna do is close down the field stop. So that is the aperture that is in front of the beam of light. I wonder, let's see if I can make the light bright enough. Sometimes you can see it even on this scope. No, it's not gonna, it's not gonna show up. Let me see. Yeah, you can't quite see it, but you can see it over there on the screen. Um, there's basically a round, well, diaphragm <laughs> that I'm controlling. I'm making it all the, you know, quite all the way open actually, and then um, all the way closed. I can already tell the scope's in trouble because it should go more wide and go uh, smaller. And you'll see it do that in a sec when I actually fix it. But one of the things I want you to notice is, so what you're looking at right now is the iris, the light coming through the, the field stop. So I basically shut down the uh, field stop in front of the column of light coming out of here. And um, the condenser is out of focus because um, first of all, I can't illuminate the whole field, but also you'll notice that when I shut it down and I'm looking just at the edges of this diaphragm, they're blurry. <laughs> That's no good. I don't like, we don't like blurry things in microscopy. We always want everything to be in focus. So the first thing I'm gonna to have to do is to get that basically column of light or circle of light. Hey, you made it, Sherry. We just started actually. I'm, I'm showing how to color. Um, so let's get that circle of light to be in focus. To do that, I'm gonna move the focus knob. So this is a focus for the condenser itself. The other one was focusing the stage. This is just, there's no fine or coarse, it's just focusing the condenser. And um, hey, Elian, you want to focus the condenser uh, um, while watching the edges of that circle, which actually is a polygon. Once you get a crisp, you'll be able to see that. So I was way, way ahead of go. See how I'm getting smaller now? <laughs> that's why I knew I was like, oh, that's so messed up. And it is not, that is funny, like a minute ago, it was perfect and now it's being all, it's not giving me a sharp image. Oh, I know why there's too much light. Okay, let me take down the light a little. Sometimes if things are too bright, it'll bleed past the edges and you can't quite see a nice crisp edge. Okay, so do you see how I'm, it's crisper now, there's that, oh, look, I hope it's showing up. The edges are a lot crisper now. Like you can actually see that it's a polygon. There's an edge and edge and edge. Good, thank you. I appreciate the thumbs up a lot. You know, so that's better. <laughs> Remember this big blurry circle before? Here, let me do it again. Um, so I'm gonna move it so that it's out of whack and it's blurry and then it's like totally far gone. Oh my God, the light is horrible. I'm starting to see dirt in uh, different parts of the scope there actually possibly. Let me see if I move it. Yeah, 
So anyway, that's just, the light is so out of whack that I'm just seeing random stuff show up. So we had to move that condenser way far from where it was because it was completely out of whack. And then around here, it starts to get nice and crisp. It's a little small, so it's hard to tell, but it looks like the edges are in focus. Now, that's good, that's step one. It's physically in the right spot in relationship to the stage. What we've been doing is moving it away and towards the stage. And so it's what happens to the light is there's a beam of light and the condenser condenses it and focuses it to a point onto your specimen. So that's why if your condenser's out of whack, things are the beams of light aren't getting focused on your specimen and you're never gonna get a really good image of it. So now we've put it so that we know where this, the, best, the stage needs to be in relationship to the objective. And now we've put the condenser in the right um, plane in Z. So we've moved it up and down till it's where it needs to be. So now the objective, the stage, the condenser are all where they need to be, except for one thing. This condenser is not in this, this, <laughs> this spot of light is not in the center of your field of view. Do you see that? Do you guys see how it's kind of off a little towards this side? It's not really dead center. And in case you, you know, maybe you don't perceive that, I can open it. <laughs> Oops, I'm doing the wrong thing. Sorry, because I'm talking. Okay, so there it's in focus, more or less. Come back there. I can open it up, open the leaves up, open the hole up. And you can see that, that it's almost center actually, but it's not quite, it's actually not as bad as I thought when I opened it up. By the way, now I'm gonna focus it a little bit better. Sometimes there, it's a little sharper. Um, so what I want to do now is to get it completely centered and to do that I'm going to use these little centering screws and they look like this on pretty much every scope I've ever seen. They are literally two screws right on the side of the condenser. I, sometimes there's, I think on the Meiji's, we'll come back to that later, there's a third screw over here that you don't want to touch because the whole condenser falls out. Or oh, in this case, it's really weird how they do that. In this scope, for instance, the screw you don't want to touch is right in front of you where you want to touch it. <laughs> exactly. It's like, really? You think people aren't going to play with that screw? If I unscrew this, the whole assembly, this whole thing um, falls down, which is just ridiculous. But, you know, so anytime... Uh, anytime you're on a scope, proceed gently and with caution. You know the three things not to do to the scope. It's fine to play around with screws, but just be aware that things might fall out. So always be like kind of ready and hovering with your other hand. Okay, so I know these are the centering screws, so I'm going to play with them. And what you basically do, so watch, I'm moving one of them and it moves it in a certain direction. Now it's really off center. It's focused, but it's obviously not in the center anymore, right? So that was not so helpful. Now I'm gonna grab the other screw on the other side and I'm gonna move it off in the other direction. <laughs> and again, too much, not so helpful. Or I can go, that was turning it, uh, I was turning it this way. Now I'm gonna turn that same screw this way, you know? And to me, this point feels a lot like playing some sort of, video game or something, to be honest, because what you do is you just do it with feel. And in your case, instead of looking on, a, on the computer, you would be looking in the oculars while you're doing this and your hands are just down here and you're just moving them. And here's the thing, you can move them one at a time till you get it just right. Or you can move them, I'm gonna see if, let me, hmm, wanna put it down so that, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to, <laughs> where I can put this iPad so, you, so I can use both hands. Well, um, I can't demonstrate that, but basically you can use both hands and then it will move in a slightly different direction than with one hand or another. And you just sort of play around with it till you can see that it's centered. 
Now, a lot of, I find it interesting that a lot of microscopy um, sort of how to's will tell you to color, I mean, to center it <laughs> while it's still closed down. So you can see how you can see that it's, a, it's not an actual circle because it's nicely in focus again. Um, so there's a lot of people who will center it when it looks like this. There's absolutely no reason to do that. <laughs> I don't know why people do that. You can open it up and say, I mean, okay, here's the only reason. If it's really lost and it's like somewhere, let's move it. You know, so a lot of times scopes that have been really mistreated, you'll find that the um, your light is down here <laughs> or something like that. You're like, well, no wonder you can't see anything. Your light is totally, it's oblique. It's coming in from an angle. It's supposed to go straight up to your specimen and, you know, like this. And it's actually kind of doing, come sneaking in from the side and things might get interesting, but it's not what you want. Um, you know, so sometimes if your, your condenser is so far out of whack, you do want it all the way down. So um, I don't know why. Sometimes it just feels easier to find it that way. But but basically, this is a situation of whatever works. Basically, you're you're just working patiently, diligently. Sometimes this this scope is very responsive. Probably part of the big price tag. Um, some scopes, the centering screws are like kind of jammed, and well, I don't know. They'll only move in certain directions, and you have to go in circles to get it to center, or so on. The scope is actually pretty. Well, watch it start being silly in just a minute because I'm saying it's pretty easy to center. But yeah, so whether it's, you know, you can work with it kind of stop down, the field stop down or open, whatever works, basically. And I'm a little perplexed that it's not opening beyond. So what I wanted to show you, I know on the Meiji's it does this. I haven't colored this scope in a long time. What you should be able to do is open this so that you can't see it like you're looking in your oculars and it's touching sort of your edge of your field of view and then you just go just past and then you've colored it so that's it for oh yes there's a little last part but this is really the main thing that you're going to need to do um on your scopes if that if you put a slide on and it looks really weird and anyway, you just sort of wanna know how to do this and do this. So coloring, again, um, you stop down the field stop, which on your Meiji scopes is gonna be right here on this scope. Um, it's, it's a little wheel over here that I'm turning, but you stop down the field stop just because it's helpful basically because then you can see the column of light really nicely and then you focus it until the edges are sharp and then you play the centering screw game until as i like to think of it until it's nicely centered which this one isn't see how easily like i i sometimes think these scopes just wind comes in and they want, you know, the condenser will just wander overnight for no reason that we can ever tell. Because believe it or not, you're constantly coloring this. You would think you could just color it once and, you know, leave it there, <laughs> come back the next day. It's still, still all centered. And for, you know, the scopes, the scope elves have come in during the night and pushed your condenser around basically. So it's a good thing to check every single time before you start imaging and before you start taking images that aren't as good as they could be, go ahead and um, check to see if everything's in alignment. So to do that again, you're going to close the field stop all the way down and see if it's in focus. You really can see it best in focus when it's small, the edges, because, you know, I mean, I can see focus here, but as you can see, when I open it way out, there's so much light coming through that it's kind of, it's turning the borders into a round thing. Um, so make sure that it's in fo focus, your condenser is in the right place, basically in Z, and then make sure it's in the right place in terms of X and Y by playing with the centering screws. 
you there's a lot of coloring videos I recommend that you go look at. Um, some of them are unnecessarily complicated. The bottom line for coloring is make sure that your condenser is in the right place <laughs> in Z and in X and Y, you know, the, the centering screws. It's really that simple. It takes just a moment. Um, it'll become automatic after a while. And again, when you sit down to a scope, check your condenser first, even, you know, every day as you're using it. Uh, put the field stop down, look at it, make sure that it's in focus, and then make sure that it's still centered. Um, like it was a moment before, this is not perfectly centered yet, but we're on where our way to be centered. This is where I kind of need two hands, but I think I'm getting it with one hand. Okay, that's close. It's a little bit moved towards down here, but that's pretty good. And then just open up your field stop and um, enjoy your scope. <laughs> there is technically a last step. This is putting the condenser in the place is really the step that needs to be done that is gonna be the issue because your condenser has wandered off. Technically as part of coloring, we also consider another diaphragm. It's a diaphragm that is right, right in front of your condenser. So this field stop is actually um, like a little shutter, if you will, um, in front of the column of light, in front of the lamp. And it's down, it's in this one, it's embedded. I can't touch it and mess with it. Actually, I can't mess with anything on the scope, which is smart. Um, and there's another um, iris diaphragm and that uh, I'm kind of stumbling because there's a lot of names to it. So for today, to make it easy, I'm going to call this the field stop. And this one, I'm going to call the iris diaphragm. So by moving this slider, this little lever, I'm actually closing down another diaphragm in the field of light, but you don't see anything happening here because it's not in what's called the image plane. You might see it sort of darker, brighter, but you're not gonna really see an effect. The la a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the online info about coloring will call this your last step. And that's sort of true in the sense that you're fixing the, where the light is and so on. But here's the thing. The iris diaphragm is something that you are using constantly. You color once, hopefully, <laughs> unless your scope's really old and kind of having issues. Um, you should color once at the start of your session and then you're good. And because we're good microscopists, we check in each day. Every time we start the scope up, we just double check because it's so quick. We go, is my scope, is my condenser still in focus? Yeah. Uh, good. Is my condenser still centered? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, I can start imaging away. Then when you're imaging, every specimen you take, every mag you use, um, you should, it sounds like a song from um, Sting or the police or something, but yes, every, every image you take, every specimen you look at, you should play with the iris diaphragm. Let me show you that. I'm going to put this down for just a second and find my slide again. And let's see if it looks any better now that I've colored. <laughs> this scope is not going to be my friend today. Oh, I'm on the I'm on the paper, which actually that's your first lab. You're going to do a letter E, so it looks something like that. But let's go away from the paper. Let's come over to the specimen itself. And why is it doing this? Okay, this is kind of weird. I'm gonna, so this is something else than the scope that you won't have to deal with. Wow, it's doing bizarre stuff for me. Huh. It's not gonna let me, let's see. Come over here. Sorry, you will not have this issue with the Magis. They are much simpler and a lot less finicky. And um, <laughs> okay. this scope is, oh, look, a histogram and a lookup table. <laughs> See, histogram, um, because this is a color. 
I'm having a moment. I don't remember this being color. I guess it is a color camera. It has three histograms. You can see that the blue is out of whack. There uh, shows up in the histogram too. There's my lookup table. Ooh, that's right. I was going to show you some of this thing. Let me hit it up. <laughs> okay. I just fixed it a little bit. Notice the dynamic range is terrible. Yes, we agree. You <laughs> look at the image. I'm like, that's no good. Let me just focus it a second and give it a little more light. So let me see if it's just playing around. Again, I'm not sure why it's only showing me the circle. That's really unusual. But hopefully, will it work with the iOS diaphragm? Yeah, you can sort of see it, see what it's doing. OK, so let me give it a little bit more light. Because OK, so this is a bad image, right? Look at the histogram. Good Lord. Just <laughs> like I'm throwing away all this data. It's all saturated. Oh, that's awful. Awful image, awful histogram. I can tell. I'm doing that on purpose for the moment because I'm going to move the iris diaphragm and hopefully you'll see a difference. No, it doesn't really work. Okay, let's take it down to a more reasonable um, histogram, more reasonable image. So, iris diaphragm, you can kind of see with this image, um, I mean, with the scope, I will find some better examples for you guys next week to show you. But what you're doing here is um, basically, it's a trade off with the iris diaphragm fully open, you're getting the best possible resolution you can get with it shut down all the way down you're getting a more contrasty image, which in this case, in this tissue, I like better actually, <laughs> I would pick this one. And then I would, I would look over here at the, um, at the histogram and go, um, that's not really good. Let me fix it a little bit. And I'm fixing it by playing with the light, but I could also play with the exposure time. It's just quicker while I'm demoing to uh, bring the light down a little bit. I want to show you a contrast stretch. Whoa, that's ugly. <laughs> it's not necessary because actually, um, so I've saturated the black end over here, which is not good, but I'm doing kind of good on the white end. Um, I don't really need a contrast stretch this image, but okay, here it is. Here's a contrast stretch. I hope you can see that. And this makes gamma really easy. Oh, no, it's not curving it. I take it back. This software is, is not very user friendly to do gamma. I'm gonna have to come in somewhere else. Okay, we'll say that for next week because I wanna come back to coloring. <laughs> Um, let me show you on the Magies, which I'm going to take a second. I'm going to bring one over to where I am. I am, you can't see me, but I am using two hands. I assure you <laughs> that is what I'm doing. Okay, so now we have a Meiji. I wanna show you where those parts are on the Meiji that I was talking about. So here's your condenser. Here's the field stop. See, it's really nice. It's really, it's right there. This is a beam of light and you're gonna close it down. So the first thing you're gonna do is actually put your slide on and focus it for X objective, you're going to focus it. Course focus is okay with the 4X. You're going to move it all the way up. And then while looking through the oculars, you're going to come down and, oh, it's in focus now. Great. Okay. So once it's in focus, you can leave the slide there or take it away. It's your, as you prefer. And then you're going to close the field stop down this thing. And you'll be looking through 
through the oculars. So it would be really obvious that's closed all the way down. And then you're gonna, here's the um, focus for the condenser. How is it low battery when it's charged in? I think this is draining it a lot. Interesting. Okay, so um, this is the focus for the condenser. You can see it, right? It's moving the condenser up and down. Anything far away from the stage is wrong. <laughs> that is just for like, cleaning the condenser, things like that. You're never gonna actually image with it there. The condenser is gonna need to be very close to the stage and it's a matter, but not quite at its max. It's gonna be somewhere just a little bit down. Um, um, yeah, scopes let you do things you never need to do sometimes. The software for scopes really does that, an amazing amount of random useless things. Okay, so I'm turning this scope around so that now I can show you now that we've been, you know, moving the condenser into place, so the stage was in the right place because we made sure the slide, we could see the slide and it was in focus. Then we closed the field stop down. We got the condenser um, to be in the right place, which is going to be near the stage and not like all, not all the way down here again, but it's going to be somewhere up near the stage. And then the last, but the next, not the least at all of things to do, especially on these scopes, is to play with the centering screws, which are really beautifully placed right there for you to use. And good Lord, this is actually not even tight. There is a third screw over here, which you might think is a centering screw because, you know, it's near the centering screws. Centering screws are the twos, two right here. This screw actually lets you <laughs> take the condenser in or out, which if it's, uh, which normally you're not doing again, unless you're, you know, on purpose fixing the scope or something. Hopefully on yours, it's screwed tight and it's where it needs to be. And if not, let's talk during lab or call or text uh, Dante or something. This may be one we didn't give you because I'm noticing <laughs> No matter what I do, this condenser travels, which is not something you want. You want your condenser to be there. And then you're moving your, these centering screws just tweak it just lightly, but it will look like a big deal to you. And here it'll look like it's traveling around like you saw this one do. Okay, so, and then last but not least, um, on these, you do have... <laughs> Okay, you do have an iris diaphragm. This, weirdly enough, an iris diaphragm, trying to think on my other scopes. Let's see if this one, no, that one doesn't have. So I'll, <laughs> I was gonna say, usually the iris diaphragm is actually a little lever that sticks out. In this case, it's not a lever, but it, I mean, there is a lever. You can actually see that I'm doing something when you look at the light, right? But uh, on screen again, it just changes a little bit, but we can kind of see it with our own eyes here. Um, so, and when I was um, changing this down, you, I don't know if you, yeah, you can sort of see it. Like I'm closing it down, now I'm opening it, closing it down, opening it. So, okay, so on this, it's not a lever. On a lot of scopes, it is a little lever right here. On this, it's a little circle. And actually, um, here, this needs to be at the front, and it shows you this is fully closed. <laughs> I had to look, and this is fully open. And if this scope were plugged in, you would see the same thing as what I'm doing here, where you can see lots of light, great resolution. You know, there it is. Um, closing it down, there it is. More contrast, less resolution. It's subtle, but powerful. And this using this iris diaphragm makes a big difference on certain specimens. Other specimens, it makes almost no difference. So it just depends, but you should always be playing constantly with this. As a microscopist, um, you know, you're gonna get your slide, you're gonna put it on here, you're gonna get into focus, you're gonna forget the course focus after you get the forex in focus. And then you are going to um, only not use the fine focus after that, but then you're gonna, before you start taking images or really looking at anything, you're gonna close the field stop all the way down. 
you're going to put the condenser in the right place in Z. You're going to put the condenser in the right place in XY using the centering screws. You're going to open the field stop back up. And then you're and then at, you're ready to go now. <laughs> and after that, you're going to endlessly play with the iris diaphragm to see if it helps or makes it worse. And where you want to put it, it's up to you. You're going to endlessly play with the rheostat, which is over here. Do you want more light, less light? And honestly, kind of on this scope, that's the main two things that you can do, as long as it's actually in focus. Um, an important thing that I didn't say is you color the forex, but then you should go in and color each objective because you're gonna be able to see a little bit better with each objective if, it, what, if your condenser was actually in focus and if it was actually centered. And then when you get to whatever your top objective is, um, if you're not doing oil that day, you don't have to go to your oil objective just to color it. But whatever objective you're going to use, go to the top objective, the highest mag, and um, color it really quickly, which basically, you know, do the part of is it in focus? Is it centered for each objective? And once you've done it for your highest mag, when you go back to your lowest mag, it's going to be fine. It's going to be even better. So whatever. So what works for the lowest mag doesn't necessarily work for the highest, but what works for the highest is will be even better for the lowest. Let me show you that over here on this scope, actually. So I showed you um, this. This scope has a two point five x for. I don't know why. <laughs> it's a atypical lowest mag instead of a four x but I'm gonna to go to the 10X. So we did a pretty good job on the 4X. Oh, ignore the light. It's doing auto exposure and it's doing really badly <laughs> as, as software does. So um, we're, I'm gonna take it over to the next objective on this scope, which is 10X. And, um, and let's show it to you, give me an exposure. See, it's doing auto exposure is just ridiculous on this, come on. Maybe a little bit better. So, okay, got that. Um, so notice that, so I gave it another exposure and uh, excuse the camera, it's just doing silly things, giving me weird colors, but um, rather than troubleshooting that, we're just gonna look at, so I just adjusted the fine focus because I was, <laughs> Also not perfectly in focus, actually. And now I'm going to go ahead and stop down. There it is. So I'm gonna stop, I stopped down the condenser and it looked like it was in focus before. It's not in focus anymore, right? I didn't do anything, I didn't move it. <laughs> it's just that I can see better. Um, and I might just get rid of this since it's distracting me a little bit. And you can see that it's almost in focus, but not quite perfect. And that's typical. You should be able to see that, oh, I can make it better now that I'm at a higher mag. So I'm gonna make it a tiny bit better. And then usually it's focus, that's the issue. Look how nice and crisp it is now. Oh, so much better. Look at all that dirt in the scope. This is dirt <laughs> um, in different places inside the scope. Um, and now it is letting me go just past. This is where we want to open it just past. So, um, and I can also see that it's not quite centered. It needs to scooch up a little bit. I can sort of see it better. I think I knew that from before, but I can see it a little bit better. It's hard to do with one hand. Uh, that's almost a little bit better in center. Okay, so we made it better with the next power. Let's keep going up. I'm gonna go up to, what is this? This is a 20X. I'm gonna stop it down again. This time, ah, it's kind of, yeah, it's pretty good actually. I don't think, I think it's already in focus. I can play with a little to see, but I think I had found the sweet spot before, but I can see already that <laughs> the 20X is showing me exactly how not centered it was. 
<laughs> okay, I mean, it's close, but you know, it's not yet perfect. And we like to be as perfect as we can when we're starting out. Um, because you want every advantage the scope can give you with perfect illumination. You want sort of everything to be as good as possible. Your slide, the scope, et cetera. Gets hard with one hand, but there we go. And we're gonna go, yep, we're gonna go one more over. Again, I'm gonna close the field stop down. <laughs> oh, the scope has issues with this objective. This is not a good example. Well, let me see if I can. Okay, we will, well, yeah, there's some issues in the light path there. We'll ignore this objectives for now. Um, I hope you got the idea that as I went through each of these objectives, I colored it better here. Now I can go back to four and sorry, that's the digital, that's the software doing silly things with the exposure. Um, so it's, it's, you know, tiny little spot with crisp edges back at 4x. It's nice and colored and centered. It's good here too. It's not quite centered, but it's pretty good at the next highest objective. And so what worked for the highest uh, power works for everything um, lesser than it. All right. I think that's it for this part before, and we'll take a, a little stretch break and so on, and I'm gonna plug this in in a different location. Um, any questions about coloring? I'm gonna recap it really fast. Let me see, how are we doing on time? Yeah, let me recap it real fast. So coloring is basically making sure your light path is correct and the biggest thing that you're going to have to do is make sure the condenser is in the right place because condensers like to walk around i don't know what they're up to certainly when you unpack your scope your condenser may have moved a little bit um so before you start imaging you're going to first place your stage where it needs to be which you do by starting at 4x because that's the one we can't um ram into the stage whoa let's go back all oh, right, I'm looking for 4x and this one doesn't have it. It's a 2.5x in this case, it's an orange one. So you're gonna focus by moving all the way up with the course focus and then down until something's in focus using your oculars. And then after that, you forget the course focus exists and you start only using the fine focus for the 4x and also for everything else. Anything else only uses the fine focus. 4X is the only one that ever gets to use the course focus. Okay, so my stage is in place. And then I'm gonna take the slide off that I had on that I was using to figure out where I need to put the stage because um, I was looking to make sure the specimen edges were crisp. The stage is in the right place. What about the condenser? How are we gonna figure that out? To figure it out, we're gonna close down the field stop, which Actually, let me do it over on the scope that you're actually going to use. So you use the course focus only with 4x, and then you forget it exists, and you only use the fine focus. On these scopes, don't ever use this thing. Um, it's just leave it alone. <laughs> it's the tension spring. This is the course focus right here. This one. Be gentle. Some of them are a little bit stuck, so, you know. It might be very slow and that's fine because you want to go slow with course focus. Fine focus, you can use your fingers or, I mean, you can use, you can go like this, which is actually using your wrist to do it, or you can go like this. Okay, so I've adjusted it. I personally like to take the slide off and just see the light. Now I'm going to close the field stop down. I'm going to move this condenser focus until the condenser is where it needs to be. I know that because the edges are crisp as I'm looking through here. And then I'm going to use the centering screws to make sure that um, the condenser is centered. I am not going to use this other screw that should not be there and will cause everything to fall off. So I'm going to use these centering screws. That's it. I have now colored for this objective. And then before I start imaging and getting engrossed in what I'm doing, I'm going to go to the 10x and I'm going to color it again. So I'm going to 
Again, put close this down. Z condenser, get it in focus. X and Y condenser, get it centered where it needs to be. You're going to only need to adjust it a tiny bit at this point because you were pretty good with a 4X. And then you're going to go to, why is this one? Yeah, this one has, okay, 40X. Um, you're going to go to the 40X and do the same, close this down, um, focus it a teach, you know, just a scooch, maybe not at all. Center it almost always. <laughs> You're gonna realize you weren't perfectly centered, so center it even a little bit better, and then open it up just past your field of view. And now you're ready to start taking gorgeous images, and well, or to finding gorgeous things to look at. Um, if you have a way to put your cell phone up, I showed you last time, you just sort of you know rest it against your hand. Um, you can actually turn this into digital scope basically with your cell phone. Um, and also, once you start your imaging various things, you're going to always play with the iris condenser right here. If you can see that, yep, yeah, iris condenser. And um, just do whatever works best. You know, if you want to keep it open, it looks great, all the way shut. Play with that, play with the rheostat, play with your mag, um, and find great things through your scope. All right. That was my recap. Any questions? You have all this info in lab two, just so you know. And um, you're also going to have a video about it probably on Friday with words to what I've been saying. What? Facing that way? Dude, Kara fucking keeps pressing the button. I think the one time I was fucking murky niggas and I got, and I was like, I had like two people down and fucking she did that shit. Are you hearing me, Flo? Hmm. 
Do the hug. Excuse me. Oh, five minute break. <clears throat> oh, good. Hey, everyone, can you hear me? <laughs> Fine, eight, thanks. Am I still? You can hear me now. Good. I had to fix a few things. Um, yeah, we're taking a five minute break till seven o'clock. Yay. Thank you so much. Um, now I'm on my phone because my fully charged iPad just decided to not be fully charged, even though plugged in. Oh, look, now it came back to life. Of course it did. Um, okay. I'm going to move to a different location. So just give me a second to unplug. Everything again. Wow, it's bizarrely cold over here. All right, can everybody hear me and see what I'm doing? I'm gonna try, I don't trust my iPad, so I'm gonna try to do this off my phone. Let's see, I practice this with my iPad, but I think that's kinda, just lift it up a bit. Hello. <laughs> Yes. That's no problem. <laughs> and then I'm actually recording. Oh, are you? Yes. Well, welcome. And Dante, if you knock in your mirror, and he'll give you his like, the, the, he'll give you a scope. Okay, cool. All right. All right. So, All right. All right. Nice to meet you. Right. Sorry, can't do that for you. You can. <laughs> Hey, okay, folks, I'm back. <laughs> Are you still there? Is everyone still there? And can you see pretty well? Oh, I think so. It's not bad, huh? Okay, give me a thumbs up, folks. Thank you. Awesome. Right, I can see less people on this. Good. Okay, so what I want to show you is how to make your first slides, because <laughs> hopefully you'll be doing that, those of you with the scopes at home. And if not, um, you'll be doing it eventually this semester. So um, you take a slide, you know, and if you're lucky, it's got this little easy to write on surface here. Um, and if so, the first thing you want to do, I want to teach you good lab practices and get in the habit. The minute you pick up a slide and you're like, I'm going to make a slide of something. The first thing you do is label it. And I'm a big fan of labeling everything in a lab. You can, you, it's hard to over label basically. By the way, how is the audio quality now that I'm on my phone? Is it, can you still hear me? Is it better or worse? <laughs> Thumbs up, thank you, appreciate it. Okay, good. Um, so I will write my initials, I will write the date. We, in a lab, we use Sharpies always for everything. They're wonderful. And then I will write um, what the specimen is, cheek cells. And then I will go to my um, lab notebook. Actually, let me get it. Thank 
don't think I've shown you this previously. This is the sort of standard lab notebook a lot of us use, but as you know, you just have to have it with numbered pages. Oh, look, there's me <laughs> forgetting it. <laughs> it's upside down. Forgetting and turning something in. I mean, just, uh, you know, pasting it in. But this is a lab notebook, okay? So I'll go to my lab notebook. I'll write down what I'm doing. What I'm trying to point out, out is always write down things. You're writing as you go. You're labeling everything you do, et cetera. Okay, so I've got this nice clean slide. It's labeled. And then I'm not going to show you this part, but <laughs> you're going to do cheek cells. You just take a toothpick and just gently scrape the inside of your cheek. It, the science should not hurt, okay? <laughs> so super gently. And then you're going to have a little tiny glob of spit. That maybe you can see, maybe not. Sometimes you just have to believe it's there. And there's going to be cheek cells and you're going to dab it on your slide and it may just look as invisible as that. The next thing that you need to do, um, don't wave it around like I, if I actually had something, I won't wave it around so much. Um, the next thing you're going to have to do is add some liquid because the optics just work better. And maybe you have in your case, you're going to have some fluids like PBS, which is just saline buffer in little Eppendorf's so little test tubes that are in your um, that come with your kit. I happen to just have a whole lot of dye here. One of them, um, one of your test tubes gives you some methylene blue. You're going to take a little um, transfer pipette that you have, or in the case here, I'm going to take some straight out of the bottle. Now, <laughs> what I want to point out about methylene blue is it's it, it's very powerful. It just You just need a teensy bit like, wow, I actually put too little on. I managed to do that. You just need a little bit of it, plus your cheek cells. And that is more than enough to stain your cheek cells. So next thing you're going to do is put a cover slip. This is really the thing I want to show you most, to be honest. So cover slips, as a microscopist, I don't know, you're just, we're kind of perpetually in love with cover slips. So, um, <laughs> First of all, these are not reusable. Never wash a cover slip. Just when you're done, um, either the whole thing goes into glass waste or you take the cover slip off and reuse the slide, but you never reuse cover slips. Look how tiny they are. It's too easy to cut yourself or, you know, they're just fragile. So um, don't reuse cover slips. And then how do you put them on? You want to put them on so that you don't get bubbles. And so the best way, let's see if I can do this safely with the methylene blue, yeah, um, is, I'm not sure it's really showing up in the video, but you want to basically put it at a 45 degree angle and then let it go down and then let it just drop onto the slide and let the fluid just go under. And I almost, put too little, you would have cheek cells, so you'd have some fluid, but you basically want something like that. And if there's just a little bit of fluid, it's already going to form kind of its own tight seal. Um, but if you happen to have too much fluid, that's what the Kim wipes are for. You would, this is not Kim wipe, but you would take a Kim wipe and just put it to the side and wick it out and we can actually there's staining techniques where you just add some fluid to this side and you sort of wash out what you've got under there so you would just hold it there i have so little it's not coming out but usually you would have more fluid than this <laughs> and even if you don't what you want to do next is to um seal your uh slide i have some lab tape here if you don't have a nice easy surface to write on, then you just put some lap tape and then you can still label your slide. Okay, so we use nail polish. Nail polish is, <laughs> actually one of the advanced students was just telling me how much better it is than the sealants that we get. Uh, we can buy expensive sealant for micro slide, you know, slides, but we don't need to. We use nail polish because it's actually better. If you're in histotech, there's gonna be, um, there's different ways of sealing a slide basically. This is a very common way, although not uh, like a histotech lab fancier <laughs> versions of this basically. But, and actually you can sometimes seal it with just um, what's under the slide. 
in our case, when we're putting some fluid, like some saline, something, you know, a homemade slide, nail polish is amazing. Choice of colors, it doesn't matter. I like to color code. I get, you know, I go to the dollar store and get all sorts of cool colors. If it's too thick, you might need some acetone. So I recommend doing four dots. So just a dot, start with a dot on each of the four corners because that way your um, specimen in your um, cover slip is not gonna slip slide around while you're painting it. So four dots to anchor it and then just gently a first coat. You know, you can also, I sometimes just dot, dot, dot if it sort of feels like it's gonna move. But basically you give it your first coat. And then if you're like me, I'm gonna hurry this up. You're very impatient and you wanna look at what's under there. Um, I notice I'm, I'm doing kind of a bad job of this cause I'm covering up a lot of my specimen. But if I have cheek cells, I know they're in the middle. It's probably okay. I probably should have put some acetone because it's a little thick. But there you go. That's the first coat. And then uh, if you're like me, you blow on it or wave it around because you're impatient. You're like, hurry up and dry. You need it. <laughs> if you have a nearby nail salon, you st I always want to get one of those machines that you stick it under and it cures it real fast. But anyway, you're like, hurry up, hurry up and dry. And then in two or three minutes later, when it is dry, you should go back and put another coat. Because now you will, and I like to just, sometimes I just get really liberal with the nail polish like that. But you'll have a better seal if you have two coats on. But something very important to think about is do not you know, and then go in both directions. Do not put this under the microscope. It's still wet. You could get nail polish on your really precious objective and you don't want to do that. Um, wait, you know, so fully do this, wait until it's fully dry and there you have it, a slide. And you can keep your slides that you make um, in your, we gave you an empty slide box that you can put things. So obviously <laughs> you can make, you're going to make cheek cells, but you can make all sorts of cool, fun slides with whatever you find out there and want to look at. Some of the things are going to be too fat. <laughs> and that's where a depression site comes in. I think I showed you this last time. This one happens to have two cavities. So then something's really fat. You can put in a depression slide, put some fluid in it, and then, you know, just put the cover slip over the top of it. And, um, you may or may not want to seal it because it just depends on what it is. Um, if you seal it, it's better all around because you can keep it, you can use it time and time and again. Um, you know, you've labeled it, you can save it. Um, even if you've sealed it, honestly, it's easy to sort of use a little bit of acetone and unseal it. With depression slides, since you probably only have the one that we gave you, you it's you must put a cover slip on before you look at it under a scope. You don't always have to seal it. If you're like, I'm just looking right now at some pond water and I'm about to use a depression slide in 10 minutes to look at something else, then use a cover slip, throw it away, might get some glass, uh, get a little cup or something to put your glass waste in and then just put a lot of paper towels is what I do when I'm at home so nobody gets cut on it. Um, but you, you know, you can you put another specimen in and then get another cover slip, the second one. Use a lot of cover slips. Don't don't get stingy with the cover slips because um, anytime people do try to get careful with using too few of them, they always end up broken. So we do go through a lot of lens paper and a lot of cover slips, to be honest, and a lot of plastics in labs. I'm gonna throw this away. Actually, let me show you where I threw it away. My phone. Um, we have sharps waste and biohazard sharps waste. So I threw it into the sharps waste. Um, that's, you know, so in a regular lab, you would throw it into the sharps waste. 
now I'm upside down from where you were before, I think. But um, that's basically it. Let me turn this around so you can see me. Ah, there, there I am. <laughs> it's like coming from below. Okay, so that's take a second and look at my toys. I set out toys here. Um, as I like to think of them to make sure I showed you everything I needed to show you. Yeah, so those are the instructions for making your cheek cell slide. They are the instructions for pretty much making any slide and um, just have fun with the scopes at home. Be creative, explore. I'm gonna show you a few more tricks in the coming days. Actually, I'm the last one left. Nate had just stopped by to say hi, so they put on my mask. Um, trying to think. Um, yeah, I'm gonna show you a couple of tricks and things, fun things you can do with your scope, but this is the info that you need to get started. And since I think several of you already have them at home, you can get started as soon as you wish. Just read the, read the thing on Canvas that's like the before you open the everything. Um, it's just a couple of pages and then Enjoy, you now know what not to do with the scope, which is, um, you know, don't, don't use one hand, right, from last time. Uh, be gentle with it and don't give it anything like anything sticky or dust or anything like that. Don't let it near any, any sort of um, dust and sticky fluids and don't ever force anything. So that's the sort of be kind to the scope and then don't crash the objective, which you, um, no, you can do by always using the coarse focus only with 4x and never with and the fine focus always with the other objectives. And then today you learned how to color it. So if it looks funky or like, I can't tell what's going on, this looks really terrible, probably your condenser is in the wrong place and you need to color it and then everything will look amazing on your scope. These scopes have, the Meiji scopes have really good objectives and um, you can, they're just great. Actually, you'll get some really good images. That's it. Other than those three things, <laughs> go ahead and enjoy, you know, now don't do those three things, everything else, check it out, try it. Um, don't be afraid of your scope. Uh, it's there for you to learn from. And uh, yeah, now you know how to fix the light path and you know how to make a, a slide. So you're good to go basically. Go for lab one and also check out lab two. Lab two is coloring. So you probably need to read that and you're probably gonna need to color your scopes. When, we, when you come and do them here, we color them for you <laughs> before the lab. So um, basically lab two should be lab one quite possibly. Lab one takes you through the basics. What are the parts of the scope? It gives you the letter E as a starting slide to just get used to the scope. And then when you get to the cross silk fibers, we're gonna talk about that next, next week actually, um, because it's a very simple lab exercise, but it's actually very profound in understanding how a scope works. And then the third part of the first, um, first lab is cheek cells. So looking at your own cells is the first thing that you see kind of a tradition in microscopy. Um, it's the only place you can get living tissue is from the inside easily, <laughs> like easily without hurting yourself or something like that. It's one of the few places in just scraping your cheek cells. Um, you can, a lot of people want to look at their skin, which is fun, but you're going to have only dead cells on the tips, you know, on your skin. Um, but go ahead and explore. Uh, just if you're curious, if you're interested, put it under the scope and see what it looks like. And there's no better way to learn than to just go, I wanna see this and then put it under the scope and maybe it's magnificent. Maybe it's astoundingly beautiful or maybe it's super opaque and dark and you're like, oh, this is, I can't see anything. And then you start thinking, what can I do? Can I cut it? Can I use my little razors and tweezers to make it smaller? Can I soak it? Can I dye it? Can I add a dye? What happens if I add methylene blue? Just play around with the specimens. And we all learn best by doing it ourselves. Like, honestly, if you get frustrated, that's when you're gonna learn the most because you'll remember those moments when you're like, 
I really wanted to see this specimen and um, it's not working. It doesn't look right on the scope. So how can I get at it? How can I make it visible? Any questions, any comments? I have a quick question. I know in yes. the lab you have um, different bins like the biohazard and the glass. Now when we dispose of it and um, after we're done like the cheek cells, where do we just throw it away like in our normal trash or <laughs> do we recycle it? How would we dispose of it? So it's biohazard here because it's human tissue. And so we are forced to put it um, in biohazard waste, which is correct. Um, at home, it's not much of a biohazard because it's your own human tissue. <laughs> and so your toothbrush, your, you know, it's the same level of biohazard as those other things. The only thing, so you, because you're not a legal lab, you don't have to have biohazard waste and special pickup um, any more than when you throw out your toothbrush or something. Uh, the issue at home is the glass. And it's basically, um, so I, <laughs> part of me is like, I don't wanna say anything because of legal issues on camera, but, but in truth, think about how you would dispose of broken glass in your trash. So what I do if I'm at home and I break a glass is I honestly, I just wrap it in um, a bag or like a bag. Mm -hmm old, you know, used up newspaper. Uh, paper towels, something so it's not going to... Um, oh, yeah, recycle it. bin. That's a good one. Your recycle bin, it's supposedly you're supposed to put clean glass in there. It's not really clean glass. <laughs> I kind of leave it up to your best judgment. <laughs> <laughs> There's no regulations for uh, slides at home, honestly. Nobody's gotten around to think about regulating them. So it's just be aware, like don't get caught and don't let the trash collector <laughs> get caught. Um, it, it's um, it, like here in lab, to be honest, the custodians asked us to anything that looks remotely scientific to put in the, in the, special, in the special science ways, because they don't like to see random things in the trash when they collect it. So I kind of take that mentality at home too, of like, I know that, you know, there's not a, actual custodian there's a machine that might you know that picks up our trash sort of but somebody's driving that um yeah just make sure you know nobody gets caught on it i think it's the biggest issue and okay. anything else you've collected hopefully is not toxic <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you yeah another way to deal with this that's a great question actually another way to deal with this is also possibly if you wish and this is fine collect it and when you bring you know collect in a little plastic bin or whatever you've got and um even a cup a plate paper cup or something um any sort of container and then just bring it back <laughs> when you return the scope <laughs> if you're like i don't know if this is toxic bring it bring it here we've got we pay for biohazard waste removal it's a whole big thing in science labs uh, there's all these protocols they incinerate stuff there's a specialist pickup that takes it to a specialist place to dispose of it um, depending on um, whether it's red which is biohazard uh, doesn't mean it's toxic it just means it's biological material um, anyway there's labs that have a whole system for that okay thank you for explaining that yeah. Let's see. You see, there's a on my phone. It's hard to get to the chat. Um, <laughs> do this. Yeah, reset. Yeah, like you said, exactly. Rinse. Oh, right. Rinse it. So be careful about again cover slips. Don't. Um, don't rinse them out. <laughs> they will break. They will be tiny little shards and cause splinters. So rinse, you can rinse slides and put them in the recycle bin, but cover slips, I would just, I would accumulate, like I'd have a little container of any sort and just be putting any cover slips in there and then dispose of them later on. I should say, just so you know, when we're 
we're, we're doing it in lab, we put your slides, um, cheek cells in 10% bleach. So that's what, so biohazard waste first goes into 10% bleach, which, so nine parts water, one part bleach, which kills most things in labs. It's a great way to kill stuff. Um, so we just dunk it in basically a bleach solution and anything that might be possibly biohazardous um, goes away. Um, yeah, let me put on my mask, sorry. Yeah, well, you know, I probably should be wearing it. But the building's so huge. <laughs> There's like three of us. Okay, bye, Nate. Um, okay, back to mask. Um, anything else, folks? Comments, questions? I think we're good. Let's see. Hey, Marcus. We're hey. actually just wrapping up. I'm glad to see you. Oh, I just got disconnected. I was just there the whole time. Oh, you were? Okay. I thought you were. But then, all right. I think, I think that's it. Oh, so, uh, Professor? Yes. Uh, I wasn't able, sorry uh, about that. I wasn't able to pick up my microscope today. Um, I texted Dante, I think. Yes, he and told me. I to come like next week or maybe the weekend. So I'll let him know, I guess. Yeah, he should have replied to you. Uh, thank you, sir.